I, uh, I'm going to go ahead. And, you know who I am by now. I'm Eric Butch. I'm the lead pastor here. I want to welcome everyone here for that's here for the very first time, never been here before, or you have not been here in a long time, or you're watching on your device or home or wherever you're at. And who knows? It may be 2 o'clock in the morning, five years from now. I don't know. But wherever you're at, guess what? I might not know you, but guess who knows you? Jesus knows you. He knows your heart, and he loves you, and it's not an accident you're watching us today. Can we welcome everyone that's here for the first time, everyone that's online, nice and loud. All right. We are in a series called The Beatitudes. The Beatitudes, attitudes that elevate. And, uh, and it sounds like, uh, is it a positive, a good thinking process? You know, we want to change the way we think. We don't want to have stinking thinking and all that. And all that, all that may be true to a certain extent, uh, that you can control your emotions and how you think, and it can change your chemical makeup of your brain and all that. Yeah, that's all good and all great and positive thinking. But listen, if all we have to offer here is positive thinking, good luck. We're not about positive thinking. We're about transformation thinking. We're about a supernatural cleansing of the mind and of the spirit. And so we're talking about the attitudes, and we're going to get right into it. Um, basically, it says in Matthew 5, 5, we're going to look into it. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. That's today. Blessed are the meek. How many of you would like to, if you're going to hire someone for a alignment for maybe the uh, patriots, and you want to find a lineman, what's the first thing you're going to put in the description? I want a meek linebacker. I don't want a meek linebacker. What is a meek line? I want someone that's going to put a hole in the stadium wall. They're going to knock the other guy across the stadium and put a hole in the wall. I want a, I want a tough lineman. I don't want a meeker. If that's even a word, right? I don't want a I don't want, what, what does meek mean? Meek sounds weak, right? We want to be strong. I mean, blessed are the meek. I don't like that very much. I mean, maybe that not maybe for somebody else, but I, I think going to the strong survive. It's about time that we muscled up and took our family back, took our country back. We don't need to be meek. We need to be strong, right? You hear all these types of things, and you're like, I want to be strong. And we try to muscle up on our own. We try to match ourselves. We try to be the strong parent, try, the strong leader. And if, if God is gracious enough, he'll let you fail to break that off of you because you're going to miss out, and I'm going to miss out on what God has for us. And so we're, today we're going to be talking about what it means to be meek. Now, we don't hear meek very often, do we, guys? How many people have used that in the last week? I've never used it, except for reading the Bible. I mean, no one's going, I'm just such a meek person. Imagine going for a job interview. What's your best attribute? I'm meek. <laughs> okay, oh, I just got a phone call. We got to go now. So what does it mean to be meek? And this is the basic premise of our entire series is this, Okay. Setting your attitudes on God's beatitudes will bring you to heaven's altitude. I did that so you can kind of remember it. Um, setting your attitudes to God's beatitudes will bring you to heaven's altitudes. And, and this is the issue here. Beatitudes, by the way, it comes from the Latin. It just means blessed. It doesn't mean, a be, I like to say beatitude. But what, what, is, what do you mean God's altitude? Are, are you mean we're going to fly above it all? Not necessarily, but we, God has called us to live in a different economy in this world. My children like to watch sports, always watch sports. First it's the World Series, then it's the Knicks, then it's another thing. And it's like always, Dad, I, I, I got to watch this, Dad. It's the last game. I said, we can record it. Record it and watch it the following day. I don't know, it's not the same, Dad. It's not the same. Why? I, I won't tell you to score. No, no, no. I I'll see it on social media, though. I'll hear it in school, and then I want to watch the game. Why? I, I want to I wanna feel the tension of it all. In many ways, everybody, a lot of us don't understand that Jesus won the game. He won the Super Bowl of all history. And so, listen, you may go through difficult times, but you want to have heaven's altitude The only way you're going to have heaven's altitude is to get off the earth and get our mind into heaven and to realize that Jesus won the battle. He won the battle. So I know how the game ends. Is it still difficult? Yes. Do I still cry? Yes. Do I still go through pain? Absolutely. But I'm not in despair. I'm struggling. I might get depressed once in a while. I might feel like giving up once in a while. I might feel like I can't go another day, God. I, I, I don't even know you're real, God. Are you even there? But in the back of my mind, I'm like, I know God is there, and he won. And so I know how the game ends. What a difference it makes. That's your heavenly hope. These beatitudes do not work, and they make no sense 
without that perspective. You need an eternal perspective. That's why you'll hear me say all the time in this church, the best days are always ahead in Christ Jesus. I'm not saying your best days now are going to be great now. No. You may not experience it here. It may be there. But you know that God is with you and his peace goes with you. I've said this before and I, I wish I could live it. I don't think I can. If Jesus never did one more thing for me, it would be enough. I say that, but the truth of the matter is I'll get angry at God if I don't get what I want. Am I the only one here this morning? Yeah, God, where's my peace? God, where's, where's that situation? God, where's the situation with the church? God, why is this happening to me? God, it's not fair, right? And we can sit there and sit there, but when you get to the point and say, this is not heaven, and I am already, I have my anchor thrown to heaven, and he wins, and the best is yet to come. It may not be here. It's over there. I just want to remind you, we ever spoke the first week and how Job was over once for somebody Maybe you're just like at the, at the brink. Maybe you're like, I don't think I can take one more thing. I'm going to have a nervous breakdown. All the pressure on me. I want to let you know something. Jesus knows your pain. He understands what you're going through. And there is hope for you. It may feel like it's hopeless, but it's not. You see, when you have hope in God, and when you focus that Jesus, for the joy set before him, endured the cross, that's the key to Christianity is not a religion, a relationship with Christ. That's the key. Loving Jesus, accepting Christ, and seeing yourself in eternity. Knowing that the best is yet to come in Christ. And that gives you the strength. That's like the Apostle Paul said, struck down but not destroyed. We were, we were, we were, we were despising life, but we knew that something's better. So setting your altitude, attitudes on God's beatitudes will bring you to heaven's altitude. Changing your mind. Letting God transform your mind. We all need mind surgery. We really do. God's the greatest neurosurgeon there is. And we got to lay down and let him change the way we think and we feel. You see, there's two main keys to the Beatitudes, and here's the first one. They are impossible to understand without the context of eternity. I think we've established that, right, everybody? Everyone got that? They're impossible to understand without the context of eternity, and they're impossible. Another thing is this. It is impossible to experience without a saving relationship with Jesus. It's impossible to experience without a saving relationship with Jesus. You have to give your life to Jesus. Now, let me go ahead and bring us a little bit of context what's this happening. Jesus is in his earthly ministry. He's traveling around. He's laying hands on the sick. He's preaching amazing sermons. He, see, he says, the kingdom of heaven is here. He says, and he talks about that. I've come for those that are mourning. I've come for the broken. I've come for this. He laid hands on the sick and they recovered. He was saying the kingdom of God is here. Then what he's doing is he goes up to a mountainside, or not, more like a hillside, and he's talking to people and he takes his disciples, his kind of his, his close ones, and takes them up a little higher up, which will bring it back to our segment here today, Matthew 5, 1 through 10. And seeing the multitudes, that's still people over there, he went up on a mountain and when he was seated, his disciples came to him. So his disciples came around him. He's having like a private class sort of. And all, all of a sudden, more people start coming and start surrounding Jesus. Then he opened his mouth. Sitting down is a show, is a, is a show of authority. They stood. He said, aren't you glad? I told you that last, last time we were together. Aren't you glad I don't make you stand up and I sit down? You think I go along now? If I was sitting down, you'd be here all afternoon. Okay. Then he opened his mouth and taught them saying... Okay, blessed, Marcios, if I said it correctly, blessed, and this comes from an island, actually, Marcios is, is actually, a, I think it's Crete, it is an island, it's an island that is named, and so they took the name for this and they made it made a word, so Max Locato said, and a couple of the scholars said, I looked it up in the last couple of weeks, and that's what it means, it actually means like an island, and it would be like a self-sustaining island. It'd be like an island you never have to get off of. It's like going to Maui or something. I don't know about you. I wouldn't mind being in Maui. I feel God's calling me to plant a church in Maui. <laughs> so imagine you're in an island and you have all the food you want. You have all the coconuts. You have all the water. You have great weather. You don't have to freeze. Nothing. It's phenomenal. You are self. You are blessed. And that's what the word means. It can also mean a greeting. Like, hey, blessed be you. So what is the meaning of it? I think the meaning of it is that you have all you need. It could be happy. 
But basically, the word makias means this. It means actually comes from that place of that self-sustenance uh, that you are blessed, that you have what you need. Blessed are the poor in spirit. We talked about that that very first week. We talked about that. You can go back to cornerstonetreasure.com. I'm not going to retalk it, okay? Basically, this, having a poverty spirit. It's basically saying, uh, just like a beggar on the street needs to live every day of what he or she has been given, you and I need to align ourselves. God, unless you give to me, I cannot live. Not only that, Jesus is giving an invitation. You know, you think that Jesus would come out and, if Jesus was in the playground of your gym classes, I don't think, do they still do this in gym classes? Do they still pick teams? Or has that been, illegal, has that been outlawed? <laughs> I'm sure it hasn't been outlawed by now. It probably will be outlawed because a lot of us will have scars. But when they're picking these teams, and I'll take you, I'll take you, I'll take you, and then you're the last one left. I, I can't relate. But imagine Jesus takes the worst, the worst player first. He's calling out. He says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for there's the kingdom of God. I mean, you mean down people? Blessed are those who mourn? I don't want to hang around a bunch of mourners. I want to be a party. And he says, blessed. He's basically saying these people are blessed. Why? Why? I'll tell you the reason why. There's more hope for someone that's broken, that knows they're broken, than someone that has all their stuff together. God can work with that. But as long as we're self-sustaining, as long as we think we're self-made women and men, I'm not saying we sit around and do nothing, but if you think you're all of that and you think you're the reason you're doing well, it's all about you, you are truly in poverty. You see, the greatest in the kingdom of heaven is the person that realizes, the man and the woman, that I am nothing without God and I need God. I'm designed by God and I can never survive without God. That's the beginning part. So blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are those who mourn. Who We talked last week, Pastor Rich did a great job about mourning. Some of you are mourning for a variety of reasons. Maybe a family situation that you never asked for. Maybe children you never, you thought were going to turn out better than they did. And, and man, it's just been nothing but heartache. Maybe a marriage, you, you waited all your life to marry somebody and you married this person. Oh my goodness, and you're like, why did I do that? Maybe... I don't know what you're going through, but maybe you're going through mourning. Maybe you lost a loved one, which is happening, right? Happens all the time. People lose, their, and they're mourning. The Bible says, blessed are those, for they shall be comforted. And here today, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Inherit the earth. We're going to get into it in a few moments. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. I'm just going to read the rest of them quickly. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice, be exceedingly glad, for great is your Reward and where? Do you notice, everyone? It's all tied to this. The Beatitudes make no sense without that. They make no sense without having a relationship with Christ and being tied to an eternal perspective of what it really is true. So great is that. For they also persecuted the prophets who were before you. So today, we're going to be talking about the two main keys of the Beatitudes. Once again, is this, or several of them, actually. They are impossible to understand without the context of eternity. It is impossible to experience without a saving relationship with Jesus. What does it mean to be meek, gentle, humble? Okay, we, it's a translation from the original Greek. It doesn't necessarily mean, we don't like to use the word meek. Some translations will say gentle. Some will say all sorts of things like that. A humble. So what is meekness? Meek, humble, gentle. That's the Greek word for it. And, and as we look forward, Jesus defines meekness. So rather than try to look at a Bible dictionary, let's look what Jesus is. Jesus is meek. Jesus is gentle. Jesus is humble. So he is the, he is the utmost, utmost of what that means. He's the very living definition of meekness. It doesn't make any sense. Why would Jesus be meek? I mean, he walked around. He was extremely strong, but he was also very meek. See, this is what Jesus says. Come to me, all you who are, who are labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle 
and lowly in heart, which basically translates the same word, same exact Greek word as meek, used in this passage. Gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I used to hear this growing up. I never could understand what a yoke was. I thought it was the thing on the egg. So I'm like, you got to break the yoke. I said, I did that this morning on the way to, before I came to church. I had my toast. I broke the yoke. What does this have to do with Jesus? I didn't understand what it meant. Is there anyone else that fell into that in this place? Am I the only one that needs help? I happen to like eggs too. Sunny side. Break the toast. Okay, anyhow. So yoke would be something you put around an animal, an ox or a donkey or whatever, and they would, they would plow with it. When Jesus says, take my yoke upon you. So Jesus has a burden. I got to take this burden off of me. I, I got to take the burden I want to, and we have to do is get down. You got to lower yourself, and Jesus is right there for you. He wants to double yoke with you. He wants to go with you. But the thing is, he doesn't want you to go on your own. He wants you to follow him. Take my yoke, not your yoke. You see, I have my own yoke the way I want the church to be. I have my own yoke how I want my family to be. I have my own yoke how I want to live my life, right? I'm trying to do it. Jesus says, I want you to let it go. But Jesus, this is what your Bible says. This is what your word. No, let go of your yoke. Take my yoke. What's your yoke? Come down here. Humble yourself, and I'll show you my yoke. For I am lowly, and I'm gentle of spirit. I'm going to help you in this process. You see, everybody, so many of us are trying to do our own thing, and Jesus says, I want you to come to me. So that's the same word used. Same word used. Jesus also says this. He says, let nothing be done. Actually, this is uh, from Philippians chapter 2, uh, verse 3. It's not Matthew. Philippians chapter 2, verse 3 says this about Jesus. Let, in a few moments, let nothing be done through what? Selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each of you esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests or her own interests, but also for the interest of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in what? Christ Jesus. Jesus was better than everybody else, was he not? Absolutely. And of course, he talks about he emptied himself, became one of us. I think it's one of the most important chapters in the Bible in regards to how we're to live our life. Romans 12, 1 and 2, John 3, 16, and Philippians. This is incredible to know these things. So what does Jesus, what does Je what did Jesus do? He laid it all down. Had the same mind that was of Christ. Although he was God, he did not count equality with God something to be grasped, but emptied himself. He was strong and he emptied himself. So meekness is humble, gentle. Jesus defines meekness and meekness is not weakness. In fact, it's perhaps the greatest strength, one of the greatest strengths you and I could do is meekness. Because let's be honest, if, if I, I don't know, I read this not too long ago. I read an article and said this. Do you know, this is what it said. Don't be upset. How many of you have cats? Okay, I like cats. I do. According to the article, it said if your cat could kill you, it would. <laughs> How could you say that? Because you can overpower your cat. Get a, get a pet lion and see what happens. No, no, do not get a pet lion and see what happens. But you might have a pet lion. This has happened. They had trainers that were for years hanging out with their lions, and eventually the lion turned and killed them or swatted them. So it isn't that little kitten's not meek. It's not strong enough to be aggressive. And so maybe some of you don't have power, don't have clout, don't have political standing, don't have a lot of money. You're like, well, I'm meek. What would happen if you had the power? Would you be meek? You see, everybody, it's not about strength. It's not about ability. It's about an attitude. All right, so... Meekness is not weakness, everybody, okay? Jesus, what Jesus says in Matthew 26, do you think that I cannot appeal to my Father and he will at once send more than 12 legions of angels? A legion is actually a 1,000 soldiers. Jesus says, I could do this right now, guys. I, that, that they're telling him to do things, the disciples. And later on, we can see when he's being tried. Jesus answered to him, you would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given to you from above. Therefore, he who delivered me over to you has the greater sin. So Jesus says, no one takes my life. I voluntarily give it. And he was meek. So meekness is not weakness, although it may look like weakness, or may, it may be you're overpowered. 
That can happen. But it's more of a state of the heart than anything else. Is, you, guys, you guys tracking with me? I hope. Just give me a couple nods. You as well at home, go like this. Say yes. Okay, good. Uh, here it is. Me, humble, gentle. Okay, it is power that is under, it's what it is. Meekness is not weakness. It is power that is under God's control. True biblical meekness is power that is under God's control. What is that supposed to mean? Well, if you hear of the Hoover Dam, Built in 1935, it's 60 stories high. Hadn't been there yet, but look, let me let, I can't, I don't know if you can see it, these little cars. And, and, and it's actually three football fields wide at its widest section. And it holds back a tremendous amount of power. So this would be like meekness, of, the meekness of God. And even this is pale in comparison. But what would happen if that was unleashed? Jesus says, out of your innermost being will flow rivers of living water. You see, the same spirit that rose Christ from the dead is in us. But it's not for us to act like a black magic person or a witch or whatever or a warlock and cast spells using the Bible. No, it's knowing God's will and flowing in his will. And so what meekness really is, is God's power under his control. God's power under his control. God, I'm gonna, even though I could do this, I'm not going to because God is with me and God told me not to. So blessed are the meek. So meekness is not weakness. Remember what Jesus did. Everyone likes, all the men like to quote this. He turned over the tables of the temple. How about the apostle Paul when he's being beat up by the Romans? Hey, you can't beat me up. I'm a Roman citizen. Well, how about Peter and John? It says, hey, whether it's right for you to beat us or not, we cannot help but do what we're doing. But they did it with respect. They were under God's control. I hope you understand what I'm saying. Meekness is not weakness in the kingdom of heaven. Meekness is God's power under his control and you submitting to it and I submitting to it as well. You know, I want to close with one more story. How many of you ever heard of Moses? Okay, if you haven't, it's not Charlton Heston. If you don't know who that is, then I'm really dating myself or the prince of Egypt. Moses was a Hebrew. The Hebrews were in captivity of the Egyptians for 430 some odd years and they were slave labor, free labor. But they kept multiplying, like a lot. And they were stronger, and God's blessing was upon them. The Egyptians got a little scared, because originally they were in good, uh, good relationship with, but they got, they got jealous. And so the Pharaoh said, hey listen, we gotta take care of this. I want you to kill the, the little boys, and throw them into the Nile River, because we can't have them overpower us. Maybe another invading country will join with them, and we're gonna be gone, so we gotta take care of this. We gotta kill the unborn. We gotta kill the babies. Something's never changed in a demonic way. But I want to say this, because I realize that all of us in this room may have been affected by it one way or another. God is a God of grace. God is a God of forgiveness. And we're not here to tear anyone apart. We're here to choose life. And there is healing, and there's resurrection, and there's new days for those that have been involved with that. I hope you understand, everybody, but I, I got to report what happened. So this mother had faith, and she put him in a basket and put it in a Nile, uh, the sister Miriam kind of guided the basket near Pharaoh's daughter. Pharaoh picked it, Pharaoh's daughter picked it up, and she raised Moses to be one of her own child, Pharaoh's grandson. And he grew up in the best schools, had the best food, had the best training. And he was 40 years old, pinnacle of his career. I don't, I'm not quite sure what it would have meant, but he, he had all the education. He knew a lot about everything. And he saw one of his people being mistreated by the Egyptians, a Hebrew. And he secretly killed the Egyptian because he, he knew, I'm called to be a deliverer. That was his passion, right? And he killed the Egyptian, but it was the wrong time, right purpose, wrong time, wrong method. And he got caught. And he became a fugitive and ran to the desert for 40 years. He gets married to Zipporah. I think that's a great name for a wife. All you have to say is zip it. <laughs> I might get canceled. Sorry. But uh, so what happened was he was in the desert and then God calls him. And by the way, he was taking care of sheep. And, and, and when, if you're an Egyptian, you hate sheep are dirty. And Egyptians did not like shepherds. So he grew up in a culture where pff, the shepherds, those people, you know, those probably a butt of a lot of jokes. 
And, and so here's Moses, and what is he doing? He's not even taking care of his own sheep. He's taking care of his father's sheep. It's like driving your, your father-in-law's car, and you're married, and you're like 80 years old. That's, like, that's pretty loser-like. Come, let's be honest. You're 80 years old. You, can't, you don't even have your own sheep yet. So he's sitting there feeling like a loser probably. Think about it, right? He's got the staff in his hand, and all of a sudden God calls him through a burning bush, and Moses says, who am I? God says, what's in your hand? He says, a staff. My shame. He says, throw your shame down. And Moses' shame became the staff of God. The same God that called Moses can do, take your shame and make it powerful in your life. You may have gone through a divorce. You may have gone through some issues in your past. You may have had addiction issues. You may have all sorts of situations. You may struggle with depression. You may struggle with anxiety. You may struggle with bulimia or anorexia. I don't know what you struggle with, but if you throw it down, God can take your pain and use it for his glory if we just throw it down. Just throw it down. That's what Moses did. And so Moses went from this, he was humbled for 40 years in the desert. Now God could use him. Listen, everybody, he was meek. And the Bible talks about this. This is what happened later on. I want to give you a little background. Most of us know it, but never want to assume anything. But in Numbers 12, 1 and 4, this is what happened. Miriam and Aaron, Miriam was his sister and Aaron was his brother. How many folks know sometimes the most difficult people to deal with in your life is your family? Can I hear, oh, no. Oh, man, right? Your brother, your sister. I don't know about you. When we have family gatherings, I, trans I transport to being eight years old again. My. Right? He hit me, Dad. You know, I mean, my, my voice even changes and everything. It's just terrible. But Miriam and Aaron were jealous of Moses. They spoke against Moses because of the Cushite woman who he had married. Now, we don't know who this Cushite woman is, but some scholars believe Cushite is in Africa. Maybe she was a dark-skinned woman. So it's an interracial thing going on here. He married a Cushite woman, for he had married a Cushite woman. And they said, has the Lord indeed... Spoken only through Moses? Well, who made you? Because you're the pastor or because you're this, the other? Has he only spoken through Moses? Has he not spoken through us also? Which he did, because Aaron was a, would speak for God sometimes. And the Lord heard it. What well, is this person thinking? Because see, God honors authority. When God puts authority, we need to honor the authority, even if we disagree with the authority. It's never right to speak disparaging of a leader. Just want to let you know that. That's for free, including your boss in the break room. What a German is it? Saying, walk out. How about people start talking about the president or, the, or whatever, saying disparaging things? You can say, I don't like the policy. I don't like what they're doing. But don't be disparaging. That's never right. Anyhow, that's for free. Okay, it didn't, didn't happen in the last service. All right. And they said, has the, indeed spoken only through Moses? Has he not spoken through us also? And the Lord heard it. Now, the man Moses was very meek. Gentle, gentle spirit, more than all the people who were on the face of the earth. What I find just a little of ironic is that Moses wrote this about himself. <laughs> but all kidding aside, he was meek. He was meek. He was very gentle. Do you know what happened to Moses? The Israelites made a golden calf and all that, and they rebelled against God. And God says, hey, leave me alone, Moses. Let me go ahead and take care of these people. I'll give you a new nation better and greater. This is what Moses said. Blows me away. God, do not do that. Blot me out of your book. But don't abandon these people. Listen, guys, I know it's Pastor's Appreciation Month. I love you. I'll, I'll take a bullet for you, but I'm not going to go to hell for anybody. I'm not saying he would go to hell, but he was willing to leave God's blessing for those people. That's meek, like Jesus. Moses was a type of Jesus. He wasn't Jesus, but he was the type. Talk about meek, everybody. He's willing to lay it all down. And for you, for those of us that are parents out there, you know you do anything for your kid. I've talked to parents that had to bear their children. And so why couldn't I go instead? That's the kind of leader, that's meekness. And this is the kind of person Moses was. There's a definition of it, okay? I just want to show you so you understand what meekness is and what God is talk, Jesus is talking about here. And suddenly the Lord said to Moses and Aaron and Miriam, Come out, you three, to the tent of meeting. God's speaking to them. And the three of them came out. Now, they didn't like his Cushite wife who had dark skin. Hold on to that for a minute. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against them, and he departed. And when the cloud removed from the, over the tent, behold, Miriam was leprous, leprous like snow. 
She became, oh yeah, you don't like colored people? I'll make you even whiter. She had leprosy. So, anyhow, this is something, this, things haven't changed in all these years. The human heart has not changed. Technology has changed. The human heart has been not really changed. And Aaron turned toward Miriam, and behold, she was a leprous. And then Moses prayed for her, and she got better. But I wanted to show you how Moses, was Moses weak? Absolutely not. He led a, a group of people anywhere from uh, 800 to 2 million people. We're not quite sure. I mean, he did amazing things. He was a strong man. He was very strong, but he was meek. You see that, everybody? Meekness is not weakness. It's God's power under his control in your life. It's God's power that you are surrendered to in your life. That's what true meekness is. So how do we, how do we become meek? Jesus defines meekness. It is impossible to do without God. We must surrender to God. We must say, God, I can't. And that's a good thing if you're in that direction, okay? This is what... Um, the Apostle Paul went through. Apostle Paul wrote a third of the New Testament, amazing scholar. And he said, and he said to me, he had a thorn in the flesh. We're not quite sure what it is. I'm not going to argue about it. All, it was something he did not want to have. And he says, and he prayed three times for it. God, take this out of here. God, please, would you please heal this in my body? Or God, take care of these people. Take care of this family situation. Take care of this financial. I don't know what it was. And I actually, I'm actually glad the Bible does not tell us directly because we'd make an exception for that one thing. How many of you have a thorn in your life? Don't look to the right or the left. We all got stuff in our lives, right? God, would you take this from me? God, why did you do it for them but not for me, right? He says this, he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in what? Weakness. Therefore, most godly, I'd rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. It's okay to be weak, everybody. It may happen. You see, the apostle Paul was a very strong man, but he was meek. Do you, I hope you follow me what I'm trying to say here. What it means to be meek, it is God's power under control in your life. Not your, not your power, but God's power in you, controlling you. I like what C.S. Lewis said. If anyone liked to acquire humility, which is kind of like meekness, kind of a definition of it, I can, I think, tell him the first step. The first step is to realize that, excuse me, the first step is to realize that one is proud and a biggest step, two. At least nothing, I'm having a hard time reading this today. At least nothing, whatever, can be done before it. If you think you're not conceited, it means you are very conceited indeed. He's absolutely correct. If you don't think you're prideful and conceited and self-serving, you're, you're deceived. The first way we get free of this, everybody, is to realize that that's, that's what we do. The biggest problem in marriage and any relationship is usually, in most relationships, it's, it's about selfishness. I want it my way. My needs are not being met, and, and I'm, as a result, I'm upset. So that's what really meekness is. And so my question to you is, what do we want to be? Do you want to be meek? Blessed are the meek for theirs is the kingdom of heaven for theirs will be the kingdom of heaven my friends this is what jesus would have for us it's god's power under control let's bow our heads and pray father i thank you so much today lord i ask that you would bless us today father god we need to be meek we need to know you more father and Lord, I confess today that all of us in this room, we feel insecure many times, God. We try to muscle our way up. And Lord, we, we admire people that, uh, that make things happen. We admire strong leaders. We admire people who, who are better looking than us and have better families than us and have better jobs than we have. And we admire, we wish we could be there. And, and Lord, we, we, we want to be stronger. But Father, we recognize all of that is a false God. But Lord, we realize today that if we'll be meek, We'll empty ourselves and rely on your strength. Then we truly will inherit the kingdom of God. In Jesus' name. Amen. One final thing. You see, we must walk in the person and the power of the Holy Spirit. That's the only way you can do this. This is impossible in the natural. The Bible says this. 
The fruit of the Spirit. You might have heard of it, right? Fruit of the Spirit in your life is this. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, which we get the word meek. Self-control against such things, there's no law. So it's a work of the Holy Spirit. Do you, have a, do you have the Holy Spirit in your life working? You can ask the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, come. I need to be filled by you. I can't do this on my own. I need your spirit. Let me pray for you. Let's just bow your heads once again. Father, I pray right now, Lord, all of us in this room cannot do this, cannot live this this mind frame, cannot live these biblical principles, cannot live this way, God. The, Lord, your kingdom is not principles, it's a lifestyle. It is, it's the very essence of what we are. And Lord, we can't do it on our own. I cannot do it on my own either. So Lord, we're asking you, Holy Spirit, that you would work in us gentleness, meekness. Father, that we would relent like that dam that holds back the fury of that water, that we be strength under your control, your strength under your control in our lives. In Jesus' name. With every head bowed, let me ask you another question. If you were to die today, do you absolutely know for sure that you'd go to heaven? The good news is all of us are not good enough. None of us. The good news is Jesus is good enough. The good news is Jesus died on the cross for all of us and paved a way for us to leave our guilt, our shame, and our sin behind and to boldly go into communication and relationship with God. But there's one thing that has to happen, two things that have to happen. Number one, you've got to believe he exists. Also, be willing to lay down your life and say, God, I hand my life over to you. I'm not going to be in charge anymore. If you're willing to do this, two things, and anyone can become a believer today, and you can be saved. Maybe some of you used to walk with God, and no longer are you. Maybe you've never really given your life to Jesus. This is always a caveat. Today, Jesus is asking for all of you. With every head bowed, let me ask you, just be honest with me today, and say, Pastor, shut up your hand up and say, Pastor, I want to give my life to Christ for the very first time, or I want to renew my relationship. Anyone today? Here, go ahead, nice and high so I can see it. Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you. Anybody else this morning? Okay. Okay. Let's pray this prayer in our hearts. It's the prayer connected to God. Lord Jesus, that's right. Lord Jesus, begin to pray. Lord Jesus, I believe you're the Son of God. I believe you died on the cross for me. I believe you rose again from the dead. I ask you right now, to forgive me of all the things I've ever done wrong both known and unknown and today I give you my life I resign you are in charge I submit to you take my life Holy Spirit, come fill me now with your presence and with your power. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer, we believe you got born again and you are on a journey. Jesus never says, say a prayer goodbye. He says, come follow me. In the front pocket of your seat, there are these connection cards. If you want to pull it out, it says, my decision today, I made a new commitment or I rededicated. When you leave here today, there's boxes in the back also, if you want to also can text us as well. You can get your phone out and you can text to the number 860-499-4888. That's 860-499-4888 and write Believe in the Field and we'll give you the next steps for your faith journey. We're a bunch of people that are on a journey to grow and know God. Before we go today, you don't have to give, but you get to give. We believe that God blesses us when we give. The Bible's very clear about that, about tithes and offerings, about being generous. Again, there's no forcing on anybody. There's a four different ways you can give. You can text to Cornerstone Cheshire to 833-245-5608. You can download our PushPay app. Uh, there are boxes in the back. If you could put those connection cards in the back, 
when you leave here today, you can go to our website or you can mail the old-fashioned way. God bless you, everybody. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. May the Lord bless you, may he keep you, may his joy, his power, and his presence fill you always in Jesus' name. Amen.